Today's guest is Brandy Vega. She is the founder of Promise to Live. This is a conversation about suicide. Straight up. Just going to say it right now. And it's an important conversation. Whether you're an entrepreneur and you're suffering quietly, or like in Brandy's case, a child, not even a teenager, her daughter, and the attempt of suicide, and what that sparked in her along her journey to found an organization that now continues to not only raise awareness, because we all know that's not enough, but also continues to invite the conversation and have it. There's not much I need to say about this conversation, but there's so many reasons I want you to feel invited to listen to this. Because the truth is, you don't know who around you is contemplating this or feeling this way. And maybe this conversation can offer you the perspective, the opportunity, the subject matter. You know how I happen to be listening to this podcast just to bring it up for anyone you're concerned about. Sometimes it's all you need. And I hope that this episode does help someone. And I can't thank Brandy enough for stopping by and having this conversation with me because it had opened up the opportunity for me too. Without further ado, Brandy Vega of Promise to Live. Brandy, I'm so grateful you're here. Uh, you know, I've had m- many a conversation before um, in private with a lot of people who have mentioned uh, that had someone just spoken to them or said something to them, uh, or they wish they would have spoken to them or said something to them that things like this could have been avoided. You know, entrepreneurs are notorious for being overworked, depressed, and not even knowing it. And considering these facts, uh, I myself have had a recent loss in the family. I think what we're about to talk about is a heavy subject, but an important subject and one that actually needs conversation. So before we get into that, I want to ask you, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. I feel exceptionally blessed because I was able to have some authentic conversations last night with somebody who lost a son to suicide and and you know had him come in today I feel like these are important conversations and and I'm glad that we're talking about them because it it just has to happen. Yeah. I mean what you've built with promise to live.org why don't you walk us through the inspiration for that, the origin of that. Yeah. I almost lost my child at 12 years old to suicide. And it blew my mind because I actually used to teach suicide prevention. I worked in media. I knew what to look for. I knew the signs. In fact, I had somebody the other day ask me, I was teaching a class and they said, well, what should I look for? What are the signs? If, if, and I said, don't look for signs. We're horrible at reading each other. We're horrible at reading signs. Don't try to guess, just ask. Honest questions get honest answers. So just ask somebody, hey, are you struggling? Are you feeling suicidal? Are you dealing with your mental health? Where are you at? But I almost lost my my child and um, single mom, running a company, busy. I didn't want to talk about it because I felt like such a failure. I thought, I can't believe I almost lost her. My kid hates me so much and her life so much that she'd rather be dead. Um And I felt like everybody would think I was the world's worst parent on the planet and just all the fear, all the stigma. So we didn't talk about it. I carried that dirty, dark secret for two years, just buried within my heart. And and it was painful. It's painful when you go through something so hard and and you don't have an escape and you don't get to talk about it. And um, I was promised it would never happen again, but then it happened again two years later. And and if a friend hadn't had the courage to call 911 and please wake us up in the middle of the night, our story could have a completely different ending. And when we got to the hospital, they were so overwhelmed. They didn't even have a bed for my kid. Like they had had so many suicide attempts and the doctors and nurses were beside themselves. And, you know, like my background is I, I, I grew up poor. Um, I know what it's like to go without. So I've always loved service and humanitarian work and philanthropy and stuff. I actually volunteered at the hospital, not that one, but I volunteered at the other hospital for seven years doing spiritual care and nobody dies alone. And um, I had sat there many times as an advocate and, and some, you know, somebody there for other people. But when I'm there and I'm watching my kid, not knowing what her outcome is going to be, 
I was devastated. And so the second day I came back, they had another almost dozen suicide attempts, kids eight to 18. And I had a breakdown in my car and I'm sitting there and I'm just like, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? When you're in crisis, it's hard to find answers. You're dealing with insurance. You're like, if, if everything works out, if she lives, where do I go? What do I do? How do I navigate? I couldn't find anything. So I finally, I took out my phone and I did the most vulnerable post I've done in my entire life. And I just posted on my personal page and said, I need help. I'm not sure what's going to happen to my kid. And if she lives, I need help. What do I do? Where do I go? And that video went viral overnight. We had 12,000 views on it overnight. I woke up to hundreds of messages in my inbox from people like you and everyone you see on the street and people you work with each day and people that you admire on TV that you'd never think were struggling. And they were messaging me, sharing their story of either loss or struggle. And, um, After that aired, I used to be a broadcaster. I was in the military and I worked in TV news for many years. And I had friends at NBC reach out and say, hey, share your story on the news. Will you you please share this? We saw it. And it's so important. I was like, absolutely not. There's a lot of things I don't mind being a spokesperson for. This is not one of them. Too personal, too private, too painful. No. But I was also praying to God, like, you know, save my kid. I'll do anything you want me to do, please. What do I need to do? How do we get through this? And I got a very strong impression or message or whatever you want to believe, but it was, I'll give you a second chance. There won't be a third. And, and what are you going to do with it? And shortly after my child woke up and, and um, I was like, okay, I'll get to work. So I have a video production company. I said, what can I do? I brought groups in. Let's do stuff. Well, <clears throat> I noticed that there was gaps and I wanted to fill them. I wanted to pay it forward because I was so lucky to get a second chance. And, and it's not an easy road. My kid was in the hospital a couple of weeks in day treat, in inpatient, all this stuff. Um, two weeks later, <laughs> the news called me again and said, nobody will talk will you please reconsider it? It's such a huge, huge subject and people are afraid to talk about it. And I thought, oh man, if I'm terrified (laughs) and I'm used to being in front of these cameras and being an open book and having, you know, people judge every word I say, if I'm terrified, what does a normal person feel like? And if not me, who? So I did my story on local news said, if you're watching this, stop what you're doing and go check on your child point blank, ask them if they're suicidal, don't beat around the bush, honest questions, get honest answers. So after that happened, Philip, I got a message from a dad and he said, you just saved my daughter's life. I said, what do you mean? He said, I watched what you, you on the news and what you said, you said, go check on your kid. He goes, I felt it. I went in there. I went in her room. She had just written her note and was in the process of trying to end her life or at the hospital. And then I got another message from a family who said, thank you for being vulnerable. We watched your story on the news. We talked to our son. He confessed he had a plan to end his life this week and we're getting him help. Fast forward, that's why we're here today, right? I thought, oh man, I did not want to do it. I was very reluctant. I did the story. It My simple message on local news saved two people that we know of out of maybe 20 or 30,000 people that might've seen it. So I thought, well, what could we do if we could reach a bigger audience? I was just a little kid in 1985, but I remembered Live Aid and I thought how cool it was that all the musicians and celebrities came together to raise money for the starving kids in Africa. I was like, well, what if we could do a show that brought hope, help, healing, inspiration and resources and um, and could reach people struggling with mental health and addiction and suicide in a real way? And so I created it last year and we wanted to do something completely innovative too. I mean, I love that you're doing a podcast because we got to reach people where they are. And and that was my thing. I'm like, okay, let's deliver this message. We had 60 different performers, survivors, speakers, entertainers, influencers, all kinds. But let's live stream it to the devices and platforms people use through the people they already know and trust and follow. And that's how we reached so many people last year. Then we we learned lessons and we evolved it. And it's like, with Promise to Live this year, every 40 seconds, somebody dies by suicide. Those numbers blow my mind. 
in that same amount of time, we created Promise to Live where people can go and make a promise, whether or not you personally struggle, that doesn't matter. We're asking everybody everywhere, regardless of who you are, or where you are right now, that if you ever find yourself in that dark place, just promise, I will reach out to someone, a friend, family member, trusted resource, or call or text 988. 988 is a 911 for mental health. People don't know about it yet. And then once they make the promise, there's a share button, click share. When you share your, your promise to live on social media, like I did with my story, you become a safe place. It starts conversations. It stops stigma. It saves lives. So this is what we're saying. This is something tangible. We can all do it. It's simple, yet it's significant. And it could save your life or it could save somebody you love. You know, you mentioned something so significant. It's actually pretty close to home uh, as, as, as one of the 18 uh, and all of them estranged and fought, growing up in foster homes and everything. A lot of my siblings wow. uh, under, you know, underwent a lot of that internal turmoil. I myself, I, I overcame it through reading uh, things like uh, the four agreements and realizing, you know, okay. very similar to Michael Singer's uh, The Untethered Soul, right? I realized a lot of my pain, my thoughts weren't me, but I just happened to be the fortunate one that had access to reading comprehension at a time really early in my life at 14 with reading materials that suited directly what I needed. That has to be intervention. I don't know what it was, but it literally set me apart from all of yeah. my siblings in that respect. However, what I want to get at is kids do deal with this. And while that is a struggle, you yourself should know the way parents are fearful of anyone finding out that their kid is acting this way and what that's going to do to them. Are they in trouble? That's something that so many don't know how to navigate and often what keeps them from saying and sharing anything. I know this because it's close to home in terms of what I've seen with my siblings and their kids and what's going on. And it's, it's usually they have the greatest life. They got a home, their kids have their own rooms and this still happens for some reason. What can you share given everything you've learned so far to anyone who's listening, who is a parent, who is afraid of like, Oh, am I going to be in trouble for this? I'm trying my best. What am I going to do? What would you say to that? Parenting is hard. Adulting is hard everybody's going through this. It's the one thing, there's a grand challenge right now. And, and they took all the world leaders, a lot of them, and they said, what's the biggest issue on the planet? And they said, it's mental health, suicide, and addiction. How do we fix it? We stop the stigma. Okay, well, how do we stop the stigma? This is one way. People are afraid to talk about it because they feel like it's a reflection of them. And it was really hard for me because I looked at my kid and I'm like, you have a great life. I give you love. You have a nice, you know, house and clothes. You're not hungry. You have all the things I wished I would have had. Um, but dealing with that was was terrifying. So suicide, mental health, addiction, all these things, abuse, they don't discriminate. Young, old, rich, poor, black, white. Everyone is dealing with it. I promise you, either directly or indirectly. And when we can open up and be authentic and say, man, I'm struggling. My kid's struggling. My spouse is struggling. Whatever it is, it allows us to connect in a really meaningful way. And connection cures much from, you know, contention and heartache and feelings of this. And one thing that I've learned over the last few years is I was getting some training on safe messaging from the Suicide Prevention Coalition. And they said, you know, when people jumped off the Twin Tower, Nobody called him a coward. No one questioned their motive. They all died by suicide, technically. But they jumped because they felt the imminent doom and danger, the heat, the fire, the pressure. They felt the only way to get through it was to jump. This is what people battling this in a real way feel. And even though we might not see it and we might not feel it, that's what they feel inside at that moment. They're feeling the pain, the heat, the fire. They're feeling the only option for me right now is to jump. And I think that that brought a new perspective to me because it's hard for my mind. I, I don't struggle with that any longer. I did as a teenager. I don't struggle with that. Um, but I have empathy now for people to go, wow. And our whole goal here is you might not love yourself enough and I might not love myself enough, but I might love you. 
I might love my husband or my friends. And so when you're making a promise, studies show that people are 60 to 80% more likely to keep a promise they make ahead of time. Now, that's not directly related to mental health or suicide. But if I promise you I'm going to show up for this podcast, I'm going to be here because I gave you my word. And so I tell people, even when you don't want to live for yourself, even when you feel the pain and the heartache and the sorrow and you don't know how you're going to get through it, make that promise to somebody else. Make the promise that you'll reach out. And our whole mission here is if we can save lives through a promise or by sharing the resources that people don't know about, like NAMI, AFSP, 988, all of these incredible resources are out there that most of us don't know anything about. So that's kind of our mission. And I do want to give a shout out to USANA Health and Sciences and especially Kevin Guest. He's been an advocate. He runs a billion dollar company and he's had these struggles, people don't think, but within his own family. And so he's he's been very open and he's an advocate for this. And, and he's got, you know, hundreds of thousands of employees that work with this company and they're sharing the message. And that's our goal. Imagine the power if every single person that we know, that we work with, that we see companies, corporations, celebrities, influencers, talk about this openly, make the promise, share the promise, but speak more than anything openly about their own experience. Why am I doing this? I made a promise for my daughter. Why are other people doing it? Because they need to make a promise for themselves. And so we're just trying to create this global campaign where we can come together and say, hey, we're all in this together and we need each other and we can get through it. You're 100% right. I mean, I I love the idea of making that promise because even in the uh, self-employed world, often you're usually not a good boss uh, to yourself at first, right? When you're self-employed and you break a lot of promises and you start realizing quickly how important accountability is and that, and the idea of that and how that holds you together and how that propels you forward towards uh, the realization of success. And often the people, at least the ones that I've had in in conversation, whether they were young children or, or um, older people, you know, I've, I've, I've had a grandmother who found out the, uh, she lost all her money and well, you know, like you said, yeah. the, the heat hits, right? So from all walks of life, uh, the minute they feel, well, either I'm entirely accountable to everyone for everything, all of a sudden, that's just as bad as, well, no one cares if I'm here, right? There is no yeah. accountability. No matter what I do, who's going to care, right? And mm-hmm. that accountability, that sense of accountability. And I love that you said, in this, you, you you phrased it as promise to live because you make yourself accountable to others and it's for other people. And that yeah. in itself is leadership. And sometimes all you need to do is step into, into the inner leader in you to be the one to have that reason. And you never know what reason we're all here for, but that's as good as reason as I've ever heard to keep on keeping on, right? Is to well, say, or for those that I love, And I love that. And and that's why it is. It's the promise number two, live.org. The first promise is for you. I promise. I might be in a good place right now, but who knows what's going to happen in five years. I'm going to promise right now that if I get there, I'm going to reach out. Okay, done deal. I made the promise. The second step is for everyone else around you. You have no idea who's going through what. So you're sharing that with them saying, hey, man, I'm a safe place. If you're struggling, you can reach out. It's okay to talk about it. You're helping us really stop the stigma that starts the conversations that does save lives. And and that's what we need. We need that. We need it as a community. And it, it really is hard. It's hard sometimes to get through this and to figure out like how we navigate it as a, as a global community. There's such a stigma. I think this is the the highlight of the conversation. I, I, how I know it's a stigma is because of my own reaction to someone asking me if I was in, in any way that way or bringing it up, right? Uh, someone had shared a post about Robin Williams and, you know, how he was always smiling and what a happy guy and look what ended up happening. And uh, one of my cousins sends me a direct message on Instagram and says, hey, you know, every time I see this, all I could ever think of is you. And at first I was like, (laughs) when have I ever given you the indication, you know, that that that's who I am? But my own reaction, as visceral as it was to that, also made me realize that I have to pay attention to the way other people may see things that I don't see in myself right now. Thankfully, 
thankfully, I, I don't feel that way. Um, and and I, I am one of those people that goes the extra mile to try to make everyone happy, but mostly because of how much I did personally overcome and how hard it is for some people, specifically because of the topic of this conversation, to come right. out, to open themselves up and to come back to life, right? And and so I do go the extra mile. Sometimes it gets annoying when I'm close to the ones that I love. I, I will be the life of the party and I will engage people who seem to show that they don't want to be engaged with at all, only because I know, because when I was a child, I understood what that looked like. And I was angry and I was quiet and it was internal and it was implosive and all of those things. And, you know, you grow up and you, I've interviewed like 2000 entrepreneurs and all of them have talked about that, the mental health issue that entrepreneurs face and, and what yeah. that looks like and the pressure of knowing that you have a payroll that you may not be able to make and all their lives depend on you. And, and then even co-founders amongst themselves, which I want to introduce you to uh, post this call. And they had to open up to each other and go, you too, my goodness. And what that's done and what they did with that, which I know you're going to be excited about. And I'll talk to you after the, after our conversation yeah. here, but there's just communication and understanding our own response to that, at least in my case, seeing someone say that to me really woke me up and I said, wow, do I give the impression that I'm all smiles and giggles for no reason to hide pain? It's, it's not. I'm actually pretty boring as a person once, once the camera's off. You know, I kind of just eat my snacks and you know, I'm a pretty boring person. But I can understand where that's coming from. And just knowing my response to that is how I knew there was actually a stigma and something Something should be done about that because it should be a fair question to ask. Hey, are you doing okay today? Like, did you, I mean, but okay? it probably made you feel a little bit valued and seen. I've actually had a few people ask me over the last year, Hey, I know you're doing all this work, you're putting yourself out there. It's draining. How's your mental health? Are you doing okay? And I thought that feels good that they care enough to ask me about that. I'm doing great. It's hard. Don't get me wrong. Like I've cried plenty of times and and it's been painful throughout the process, but I loved knowing that somebody cared enough about me to just ask the question. And that's what I would challenge people right now is just ask the people around you honest questions. Are you feeling this way? And don't be afraid with what they say. There's really great resources out there like seizetheawkward.com and NAMI, N-A-M-I.org, or .org probably on the other one too, and AFSP. Like there's so many amazing resources that you you need to have these honest conversations. And, and I, I hear people all the time say, oh, my kid's fine. I'm like, how do you know? Did you ask them? I just interviewed a dad before this who lost his son to suicide and everyone thought he was fine. He was the leader in everything. He was crushing it. Wow. So we don't know what people are going through. And one thing that I've been trying to study as I go through this process is there's no shame in mental health. There's no shame in feeling suicidal. There's no shame in these things. It actually takes courage and strength to say, hey, I am struggling. I need help. Somebody I love is struggling. How do we do this? And I've been working with a lot of doctors and, and learning about things that are chemical imbalances. Maybe it's like a copper toxicity that's having an impact on postpartum um, or whatever it is. It's like they're with, with psychedelics and with ketamine and with uh, there's all these different things, breathing, breath exercises, organic connection, talking. Like there's a whole list of resources available. We just have to look and find what works for us. And, and suicide is preventable. And you can have a great life. It's not like you're broken forever, that you're dealing with this forever. I just want people to have hope and know that I can talk about this. It was scary for me. I thought, if I share with people that I'm going through this right now, as a business owner in a tough industry, as a female, I thought people are going to think maybe I'm weak and they might not want to do business with me because I'm dealing with emotional stuff. And, and they might think, oh, she can't run my production because she's dealing with this. And that's a fear. That's a fear we all have. So it's like, OK, well, how do I keep it in check? But at the end of the day, I found just being authentic and saying, yeah, we're going through this. And then they open up and then we build relationships. And then my business has never been better. And not that that's my focus, but people want to be seen and heard and know that they're dealing with authentic other people who are in the same boat as them. And I guarantee you we're all in the same boat. Yeah. Sometimes people just need the permission 
to to say what they're really feeling without yeah. fear of being judged because I, I personally you know um i've seen in my own background you know a lot of uh, a, a lot of people will look at people who went out uh, due to suicide and they'll say oh you know cowards or that's the coward's way or whatever and I, I, yeah i don't know how someone can say that right like, <laughs> it's such a complex and dynamic experience of emotions that leads to a situation like that and often we don't know what it looks like last minute just before right no. and what the, and what that looks like and so to to call us like that's the that's i think the 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 last element to cover in this conversation is it's it's not a sign of weakness that you've thought of that. Uh, the fact that you remember your mortality at all should give you even more reason to live and to know how fleeting and precious life can be. And that is strength. And you're just closer to strength than other people care to admit. Those who deny death at all and don't think about it at all and try to live as I'm going to live forever are the first ones to start being grumpy when they start to age because they can't accept the fact that there is a mortality. And so if you are listening and you feel ashamed or you feel like someone might consider you weak for that, know that you're closer to strength than you ever thought possible just because you're paying attention to the idea and addressing the idea face first, heart to heart of what mortality really means and who's going to care. And you know what? It's like promise to live, right? That's the second promise. It's like you said, the first one is to yourself and the second one is to whatever it is that's going to keep you going. Like, I feel like that really is the core of what people need to hear because it's not weak to no. contemplate death. In fact, some of the greatest philosophers have done so. <laughs> yeah. And I think about it too. It's like nobody questions somebody with cancer. Nobody questions somebody with diabetes. Nobody questions somebody who has a stroke or an aneurysm. It's like, man, I'm sorry that help happened to you. But the moment somebody says I'm struggling with my mental health or I'm feeling suicidal or I'm dealing with addiction all of a sudden, and and I think we're all guilty of it. I really do. I think this is where we have to not just say, see me, but how do we see others? Are we giving them the grace to say, hey, okay, we're here with you. We see this. Like, I, I hope that we get to a point where we can address that the same way we would give somebody who has a cancer diagnosis and say, I'm really sorry you're going through that. So you're going to get chemo. You're going to get therapy. You're going to get treatment. You're going to talk. You're going to find resources to deal with what is ailing your body because it's not your fault. You know, there's lots of things that come into play. And, and so I just hope that people are, are willing to do that. And I actually, I attended a funeral recently and there's another one this week. We lost a really, really bright, talented young man named Glad in our community here in Silicon Slopes to suicide. And um, when I went to the funeral last Everybody talks, you know, it's always hindsight. Oh gosh, Philip was incredible. I loved all the work he did. I loved, he inspired me. He motivated me. We come to these services or these wakes or these celebrations of life and, and we say all the good things about this person. We remember all their qualities. I'm like, maybe if we did this in life, we wouldn't be here. Maybe if we can try to find the good in everyone and share that. Do you know what I see in you, Philip? I see light. When you smile, you light up the room. When you share your words and your hope on this podcast, you're bringing inspiration. Thank you for what you're doing. You're saving lives. You're helping people grow and find meaning and purpose. Thank you. If, if we could share those messages with people while they're alive, when we have the moment, that connection alone and letting them be seen might be enough to get them through the hard time just to let them know they have value. So reach out today. Who can you compliment? Who can you text? Who can you call and let them know you love them? When I did spiritual care and nobody dies alone, you might get hit by a bus today. Your child might be struck in the crosswalk. There's no guarantees. So the, the promise to live isn't just about sticking around. It's not just I promise to live and suffer. No, it's I promise to live and thrive and find purpose and find meaning and help other people find that. How can I make this world a better place? How can I bring value? How can I leave a legacy? How can I give somebody hope? Where do I find my true passion? If you're lacking those things, start searching and finding it because we don't want you just to live. We want you to thrive. 
that's my wish. That's my dream. That's my goal moving forward. I love it. I I, I want to roll out the red carpet because uh, I think it's it's a it's the perfect time as we close this out. Brandy, where do you want people to go after having heard this conversation specifically? Well, I want everybody to go to promise the number two live.org and make that promise right now and think about your why. I do, <laughs> I do this every day for my child. And I do this for my friends, kids who aren't here because I got a second chance. Find your why, find your reason. Make it for someone else if it can't be for you. Share the promise. I want people to tune in. We've got a great show that we're broadcasting and live streaming September 10th. We've got amazing artists. We have Dr. Oz. We have Brandon Fugel from Skinwalker Ranch. We have um, the piano guys. I mean, we have amazing talent. So tune into our show September 10th. You can find information. Um, I want people to reach out. I want companies to reach out. We need sponsors. Um, but outside of that, I, I could care less about the money. I care more about connection. There's no ego here. It's only impact. So if you're an executive, if you're an influencer, if you're a celebrity, if you run a company or you do marketing, team up, collaborate, lead like Kevin Guest did with USANA from the top down and show your people it's okay to talk about this. Make the promise, share the promise, get involved and look out for one another. That's my wish and my goal. There, uh, a globe-wide psychological safety net that really opens up the dialogue. And then after that, the stigma is gone and people can mention it and go, I'm sorry to hear that, like you said, and yeah. see how we can work through it together. But you don't right. have to do it alone. Yep, exactly. That's my wish. Thank you for allowing me to share that here. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I'm very grateful, you know, there's there's a there's something that happened in my own personal life recently, and I'm very grateful to be able to have the conversation. I, I think it would be fitting to share it even with my own family, as uh, yeah. as they work through uh, something very very close to home with this conversation. So, thank you, Brandy. Seriously, it uh, couldn't have been a better time. Thank you. One last quick thought. I had one of my friends who runs a company, and he said, "You know, I sat down with my family on Sunday, and we talked about Promise to Live." We talked about mental health. We had every single one of them do it. Sit down with the people you love and have this conversation because it could be something that really ends up saving them. And it's simple. It's important. Just literally having the dialogue. You never know what's going to come from that. Yeah. Well, look, I can't thank you enough. And I mean this for actually opening up, sharing your story, because that was the moment that you began to change lives. So thank you for stopping by. Thank you.